In this video, we're gonna restore the main board for the Mac SE 30 restoration project. Now that we can boot the Mac SE 30 with the rebuilt floppy drive, we need to restore and recap the main board before the leaking acid from the capacitors does any more damage, starting right now. All right, here's the board for the Mac SE 30, and in preparation for recapping it, we need to clean it. Um, and of course, before I do that, I need to remove some components from it because we don't want to clean it with uh, the ROMs and RAM and the like on it. I'm being really careful here since these RAM sockets can get brittle as they age. I believe these are uh, one meg sims. Oh, you have no idea how many shots I ruined with my freaking fat head stuck under the camera. But hey, that's why we have that one. I'm also going to remove this ROM. I don't like having socketed chips on a board when I'm going to clean it with water. I just feel like the, uh, the pins in the sockets are going to hold on to that water and not allow it to release. Right into my brushes. So fortunately, this board has had zero damage from the battery leaking. There's a little bit of corrosion from the capacitors, especially up around UC8 and UD8. There's some corrosion on the pins. And all these caps are leaking a little bit, but honestly, it's not terrible. I've seen a lot worse. So need to get it cleaned up. To start off with, I just want to get some of this loose dust out of here. And then I'm just going to use a toothbrush to get the the bulk of the crud off. And once that's all loosened up, a quick blast of air to knock it loose. Next, I'm going to clean the board in the sink with some soapy water. Once that's done, I'll be back. On a personal note, I want to congratulate my 10-year-old nephew, Brendan, on completing his first solo electronics project. He did an awesome job soldering the board for this calculator. You should be proud of me. I am. Good job, dude. Now that the board has been cleaned, we want to try to neutralize the residue from the leaking capacitors. Vinegar is useful for cleaning leakage from many types of battery because the leaking material is a base, but since capacitor leakage is in itself acidic, vinegar will only make the problem worse. My preference is to use a baking soda and water solution to neutralize the acid, followed by a good cleaning with isopropyl alcohol to clean and remove the baking soda. Some people believe that the baking soda step is unnecessary and just go with the alcohol, but this has worked well for me in the past and I'm going to stick with it. All you need to do is add a small amount of water to some baking soda to make a paste. Then, just apply the mixture everywhere there is leakage, along with a bit of margin for damage that may not be visible yet. Then, using a small brush, you just work the mixture into the affected areas. Let the board sit for about half an hour, then just rinse with water and clean well with alcohol. Watching videos online over the years, I see a lot of people using the twist and remove method. That is where you grab the capacitor, get a good grip on it, twist it back and forth or rock it back and forth until it comes off. I've got to say that every time I see that, I cringe. I mean, it drives me crazy. I'm going to try removing it properly, as properly, can't see the air quotes, with the soldering iron. And uh, we'll see how that works if it doesn't. We will resort to the, uh, the atrocity method. Um, for caps on this, you have two options. And I went ahead and got some cap kits. Um, selecting capacitors is an art and a pain in the butt. Um, I went ahead and got kits just because I needed caps for the main board. I needed caps for the power supply. I needed caps for the analog board, and I also got a cap kit for my 1702 monitor. When you do the caps on the main board, you have a choice between electrolytic and tantalum. With the electrolytic, you can get more of that uh, traditional look. However, eventually those are probably going to leak as well. 
tantalum caps look different. They have their, their little orange or yellow package. They look uh, somewhat consistent with these resistor packs. Those are, yeah, resistor packs. Um, the tantalums are never gonna leak. If they fail, they will short out rather than go open. And that sounds like a big deal, but honestly, I've never seen a shorted tantalum damage something. I've certainly, it keeps the board from working until the can tantalum's removed or until the tantalum completely uh, opens up from uh, heat because when it's shorted, it'll heat up real bad. So I am gonna go ahead and put the tantalum caps on here. It doesn't look as, as original, but I feel like it's a long-term fix. Time to get out the soldering iron. And I'm gonna try using a fair amount of iron heat, a little high, not too much, but a short amount of contact time. And if that doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, if you go low heat, you have to keep the heat applied for a long time, and I don't like that because it's more likely to cause issues, in my experience. Make sure my soldering iron tip is well tinned. And then I just want the smallest amount of extra solder on the tip to... Uh, to help transfer heat. I'm gonna go ahead and apply heat. Wait about three seconds. Apply solder. Use a pair of hemostats. Apply heat on one side, it pops loose. Apply heat on the other side, it pops loose. And I can tell already, we lifted a pad. So, we're going with the other method. All right, so like I said, it drives me crazy, but it drives me even more crazy to lift a pad and I was being really careful. I started by dealing with the capacitor with the lifted pad. What I did was solder the cap to the side with the good pad first. Then I soldered a short piece of wire from the other capacitor contact to the via that the lifted pad went to. Some of you may be screaming right now that I'm making a mistake, and you'd be right. More on that later. And for the rest of these, yeah, going with that ugly method. As I proceeded to recap the rest of the board, I started with the two axial electrolytics. Since I don't need to save them, I went for the safe option of cutting their leads and then removing them each individually. You want to cut the leads so the part on the board is fairly long. The leads came out easily by just applying some heat to the lead in the pad while gently pulling the lead through. Three of the four through holes cleaned up nicely, but the fourth was on a large ground plane and did not want to fully clear. I was wary of applying too much heat to this three layer board, so I resorted to removing the last little bit of solder by drilling it out with a pin vise and a 0.8 millimeter drill bit. Next, I physically removed all the SMD caps with pliers using the twist and rock method, all the while feeling as if I was committing some horrible crime. In the end though, they all came off quite easily while leaving their leads and the bottom of the cap cans on the board. I was then able to clip the leads down a bit so the plastic can bottoms would come off easily. Next, I carefully cleaned each pad by first applying some liquid flux and a bit more solder to each pad, then, using a hot soldering iron and some desoldering braid, I removed the solder and cleaned the pads up. A few pads still had some crusty places, so I just repeated the process on those that needed it. Finally, I cleaned all the pads with alcohol and a brush, followed by some cotton swabs. Hey, Future Mike here, and there's some important points that my past self missed that you really should know if you're working on a board of your own. In fact, if you're working on a board, you really need to watch the rest of this video before you continue. The next step is to replace all the surface mount capacitors. The process is pretty simple. You add a tiny bit of solder to each pad, then, while holding the replacement capacitor in place with some tweezers, simply heat the pad and capacitor contact with the tip of your soldering iron until they're connected. If needed, you can add a little bit more solder. While I replace the rest of the caps, I wanted to say that I am really excited to get this machine up and running. I never got to experience the Classic Max, and frankly, it's my own damn fault. In the early 90s, I was heavily invested in the Amiga to the point that I was doing repairs for people, 
creating hardware as a registered hardware developer, and I was even the president of the local Amiga group. When Commodore failed, I was devastated, and I was having a hard time deciding which platform to go with, PC or Mac. I eventually decided I would go with a PC since I needed the wide variety of software that was available for the printer business I had started, and I was worried that Apple, without Steve Jobs, was heading the same way as Commodore, and I didn't want to be burned again. Obviously, the story of Steve Jobs' triumphant return to Apple and their rise to become one of the most successful companies in the world has become a modern legend. Now, with this classic Mac SE30, I can finally get to enjoy the ecosystem that I missed out on. Finally, with all the new caps installed, we cleaned up and installed the RAM, ROM, and custom ICs. Okay, so now it was time for the moment of truth. I was getting everything set up for a test, and like an idiot, I turned the switch on on the Mac before I turned the cameras on. There was a loud pop and a spark, and I could smell the magic smoke getting away. So I quickly hit record. Now we let out some of the magic smoke, so let's see what happened. As it turns out, what had happened was that I had missed the fact that tantalum capacitors are marked on their positive leads instead of the negative lead like most other capacitors. Fortunately, this kind of accident does not usually do any permanent harm, except to the capacitor and I still had the other set of electrolytic caps for the board, so I pulled all the caps I had just installed and replaced them, again. And with the marks going the exact same way as the ones that were on backwards, but this time that was the right way. Once this was done, I set everything up again for a test, and you can bet your bottom dollar that I remembered to turn on the cameras this time. I'm gonna try booting it off this hard drive. And here we go. All right, look at that, it's booting and the hard drive's working. The drive did not work before. I think it has the sticky uh, stopper, head stopper problem. So a couple of things to note here is I'm actually using the other power supply and uh, analog board because the one that I was using I discovered has some major issues and was uh, pending a severe failure but it looks like we have a working Mac. Look at that. Rebuilding the desktop file. I don't know that I want it to do that. I don't have a mouse plugged in to stop it. So like and subscribe if you want to see more on this classic Mac SE30 and other retro equipment. Here's some more videos on this classic Mac, and here's another video you might like. Well, I was going to do the analog board and the power supply in this video as well, but this is already getting long enough, so I think we'll save that for next time.